open them to the Gospel of John chapter 9. I'm preaching a series of messages on Sunday morning out of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John proclaims to us that Jesus Christ is more than a man. And so when we study the Gospel of John, we learn that, especially in the world we're living in today, right? We're living in a world that, that constantly tries to shout at us that Jesus Christ is not the way to God, that Jesus Christ is not God. And, and the Bible clearly tells us that He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. No man can come to the Father but through Him. Are you happy about that? Say amen. So we're going to be in John chapter 9, and I'm going to begin to read right there in verse 8. Now let me just share with you what we're going to do this morning. We're going to sort of pick up the story in the Gospel of John chapter 9 where we left off last week. And if you remember last week, there was a blind man that was beside the road begging. He was, he was born blind. And the Bible tells us that Jesus passed by and he saw that man. And he invested in that man. And he did a very unusual thing. He spit on the ground and he made mud pies and put it in that man's eyes. And he told that man to go down to the pool of Siloam and wash and he will see. Well, the Bible tells us he does that and a miracle happens. The man can see. It's a picture not only of physical blindness turning into physical sight, but it's also a picture of spiritual blindness. Being born again and God removing the blinders from your eyes and you being saved. And so that's where this story picks up. This man had just had a miracle. John chapter 9 verse 8, I'm going to ask you if you're able to please stand in honor and reverence for the reading of God's word. I'm preaching this morning on this subject, the voices of discouragement. The voices of discouragement. If you're ready... To hear this, say amen. Are you sure? Say amen. Okay, John chapter 9 verse 8. The Bible says, again, the man came seeing. He just got healed. The Bible says, the neighbors therefore and they which before had seen him that he was blind said, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they, Unto him, how were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. They said unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and I do see. Therefore, said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They said unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he has opened thine eyes? He said he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who has opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him, and he shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Now that's talking about Jesus. They're saying, We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. And he answered and he said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he do to thee? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I, I have told you already, 
and you did not hear, wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him, or, or that means they cursed him. And they said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, where or why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man, talking about Jesus, were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and they said unto him, Thou was altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? How dare you lecture to us? And, and notice this, and they cast him out. They excommunicated him. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Does thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Father, we ask today, that you will absolutely take over and take charge today. God, I ask you to anoint me as your messenger to preach what you've called me to preach today. I want to ask you, Lord, specifically that you will rebuke the devil and every demon from hell. Move them out of this place. Move them out of this building. And Jesus, we ask you to be the Lord of this place. Father, there are people here today that need to be born from above. People need to be saved. There's folks here right now, if they died today, they do not know whether or not they're going to go to heaven. God, I pray that you will remove the, the, the blindness from their eyes and penetrate their heart with your gospel. And I pray they'll be changed forever. God, I pray today for believers today that you have a word for today. I pray that you will penetrate our hearts. And I pray that you will give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. I pray, God, when the invitation is given, there'll be no hesitation, there'll be no reservation. But, God, there'll be a drawing of your Holy Spirit to come to Jesus today. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Now, let me remind you again. What has happened here at the very beginning of this chapter? The Bible says, one day as Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was born blind. Now, now the man was not born blind because of an accident. Remember, the man was born blind. The, the man had never seen the light of the day. He had never known anything but darkness. And all he could do was to sit beside the side of a road and beg. So when Jesus passed by and he saw this man begging, the Lord Jesus decided to do something about it. Now, now if you remember last week, we talked about that the disciples wanted to argue about why the man was blind. But, but Jesus basically said in so many words, I didn't come today to argue about why the man is blind. I've come to make blind man see. And so the Lord Jesus does a very strange thing. He just hauls off on the ground, or, or hauls off and just spits on the ground. And, and he made mud pies out of the spit and dirt, and he rubbed it in the eyes of that man. And he told that man to go to the pool of Siloam and wash the mud off your eyes. And that man never questioned him. The man went his way, and washed. And evidently somebody that had a heart for souls took that man by the hand and led him down to that pool of Siloam. And the Bible tells us when he stood up and he had cleared his eyes of that mud for the first time in his life, the man could see. 
a miracle has taken place. Now let me ask you something. Wouldn't you think that everybody would be excited about that? I mean, wouldn't you think that everybody there would be happy about that? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you think especially the religious people and all the church people would be excited about that? I mean, here is a man that was born blind. He was desperate. He was a beggar. And now for the very first time in his life, the man could see, wouldn't you think that everybody would be excited about that miracle? You know, there is a group of folks in religious circles. You can call them many things, but I choose to call them stick in the muds. Anybody know what a stick in the mud is? Some of you might not know what that is. So let me give you Webster's Dictionary definition of a stick in the mud. A stick in the mud, listen to this, is someone who prefers to allow things of seeming enjoyment to pass them by. A stick in the mud is somebody that is unprogressive. They're, they're somebody that's filled with negativity. Now listen to this. Someone who's a stick in the mud prefers to stick or, or stay or remain in the mud, which is a metaphor of discouragement and depression and unhappiness. That's the definition of a stick in the mud. A, a stick in the mud is an expert of discouragement. A, a stick in the mud is an expert of pouring cold water on your fire for God. A stick in the mud is somebody that's going to rain on your spiritual parade. They will pop your bubble. They are the voices of discouragement. And if you and I as believers in Jesus Christ don't learn how to deal with these kind of people in the world, these kind of people will allow you to, to, to rob you of your blessings. They, they will, listen, you, you will allow these people to intimidate you out of your worship, to distract you, and to rob you of the joy of your salvation. So I just want to preach this morning for a few minutes on the voices of discouragement. Now notice there, there are three voices that we see in this story uh, of a cold water committee, I guess you could say. So three voices uh, of discouragement that we find here with these individuals. Th three voices of people that want to pour cold water on your fire. And, and let me just say this to you. As believers in Jesus Christ, we need to be very careful that we are not voices of discouragement. Well, we need to be very careful that, that we aren't. A cold water committee. Is anybody hearing me? Amen. See, see, because here's what happens. There's a tendency as believers when we get our eyes on us and we get our eyes off Jesus, then we can be the voices of discouragement. And so I just want to show you this morning, I, I want to tell you what these voices of discouragement, what they will use and what they will do to rob you of the joy of your salvation. Does anybody want to hear this? Amen. Now notice with me, the very first thing that they will use is skepticism. Skepticism. See, they will question your experience. You see, notice here we have the doubting skeptics that come along here. I mean, that's the first thing that this man faced. I mean, think about this. He was delivered miraculously. And this is what the Bible says about his neighbor's reaction beginning in verse 8. Now, notice the Bible says, The neighbors therefore and they which before had seen him that he was blind said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Is not this the blind man that used to sit on the side of the road and beg? And notice in verse 9, Some said this is he, others said, he is like him. In other words, so some say, no, I think it's just a guy that looks a lot like him. But notice here, he spoke up and he said, no, it is me. 
He, he said, I am he. I was the one that was sitting on the road begging. I, I was blind. I, I was the one that was begging on the side of that road. Now, now notice here what they forced him to do. You, you see, ladies and gentlemen, skepticism can have a positive influence on your life if you'll let it. But because skeptics make you relive your experience. And when your experience with Jesus Christ is questioned, you're able to go through it again. And any time you're able to go through of your experience with Jesus, you're going to get blessed. And when you give your testimony on what Jesus Christ did for you, they ultimately cannot argue with your experience. Look at what this man does when they ask him the question in verse 10, how were your eyes open? Now notice the answer in verse 11, and I love this. He just gets right to the point. He answered and he said, a man that is called Jesus. He said, hey man, it was Jesus. Listen, this blind man mentioned the name of Jesus. He said Jesus' name. Folks, don't ever relate your experience without talking about Jesus. We are not out here pushing religion. We're exalting Jesus Christ out there. And the Bible says that he says, A man by the name of Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and, and said to me to, to go to that pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and I washed. And notice he said, I received my sight. And then the Bible goes on and they ask him, well, where is he? And, and, and he says, I, I don't know. So the Bible teaches us, get this, that he relives his experience. The, the Bible teaches us that he even refines his experience. And the more they question him, the more condensed his testimony gets. So all I'm saying to you is simply this. When you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there's probably going to be some people out there that are going to say it won't last. I know him. It won't last. I know her. It won't last. You might have family members. You might have friends or work associates that will say, I, I know him, but it will not last. Listen, maybe you're here and, and maybe it's just a situation where you're living for the Lord or you've made some commitments to stand for Jesus or you're going to be faithful serving God and, and whatever it is God's called you to do, but, but there's going to be people that are going to come and they're going to be skeptics. And they're going to say, listen, it won't last. It will not last. Well, i got to tell you, you know, when I got saved... You know, some 20-something years ago, I remember that, you know, we were living here in Oklahoma City, but, but then we moved to Muskogee, and that's where I got saved. And, and I had a lot of people here in Oklahoma City, friends that I went to school with and, you know, guys that I work with. And, of course, they knew the old Danny. And I remember here, I got to hearing what some people were saying about me over here after I got saved when I had moved. And I heard somebody say, well, I heard that Gandra guy got religion it won't last well friend I'm gonna tell you something if I would have got religion it wouldn't have lasted I didn't get religion I got Jesus and when Jesus saves you it's gonna last my friend and so hallelujah so all I'm telling you today is simply this there's gonna be people that are skeptics and they're gonna question you and they got skepticism, and they're going to say it's not going to last. And I'm just telling you, man, to keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, if you guys just got saved, and maybe you're here recently, and those people are questioning you, well, listen, keep your eyes on Jesus. Just think about how you got saved. I want you to think about just how good it is to be saved. I want you to think about what it feels like to be saved. And I just want you to think about that every day with Jesus is the sweeter than the day before. Hallelujah. So, so the first thing that you're going to get that are words of discouragement is, is, instead of rejoicing with you is skepticism. Can I get a witness on what God just said? The second thing you're going to get, which is a voice of discouragement, is criticism. Right? Criticism. Now, now follow this. We, we've got the doubting skeptics that are there. 
But all of a sudden, here comes the disapproving critics on this poor guy. Now, now notice here, um, the, the Bible says that all of a sudden comes the Pharisees. Now, now and, and let me just say this. You know, they're going to criticize him. And, and let, me, let me just throw this out there. If you're here today and you don't ever want to be criticized, then don't ever do anything for Jesus. <laughs> right? If you, don't want to, if you don't want to be criticized, don't be anything, don't do anything, don't ever say anything for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because criticism will come. You know, have you ever met anybody that's always got a critical spirit? Always trying to, you know, put somebody down or, or, or criticize somebody? Always criticizing, you know, this or that and you know, criticizing this individual or, or criticizing what they don't like in the church or, or, or what their little pet peeve is and, and just constantly criticizing. I mean, that's a miserable way to live your life, and it's miserable to be around those kind of people, amen? Criticism. Listen, guys, criticism is, is seldom constructive. Now, now, look at what happens to him. They, they, they take him... To the Pharisees. Now that's the last crowd this guy needs to talk to. The, the Bible says, notice in, in verse 15, it, it says, Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight, and he said unto them, He put clay on my eyes, and, and I washed, and I do see. And, and, and so notice, verse 16, what they said. Therefore said some of, of them, the Pharisees, This man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. In other words, Jesus healed that man on the Sabbath day. And so get this. They got all bent out of shape because Jesus healed that man on the Sabbath day. Man, you want to talk about sticking the muds. You, you want to talk about nitpickers. You, you want to talk about critical spirit and, and just self-righteous judges? And notice, they would even eventually say out of anger that Jesus is a sinner. Can you believe that? Now notice, in verse 16, they said, no sinner can do what you said he did. I mean, isn't that horrible? They criticized that man. He just got saved, and they pour cold water on his excitement. They criticize that man. Listen, friend, you're going to face that, especially if you're fired up and you're excited about the things of Jesus. You're going to face that from religious people. Pharisees were 6,000 in number. That They were in a very elite religious group. The, the word Pharisee literally means separated one. The Pharisees had 613 laws of do's and don'ts, and they prided themselves on keeping those laws. They memorized scripture. They attended church on a regular basis. They even tithed. They prided themselves on their morality. They were religious folks. And when they found out that this man was healed on the Sabbath, they cannot rejoice in his healing. And one of the things that they say, and I won't go through all the scripture again, but they basically said, we've never seen it recorded that anyone was healed of blindness in the Old Testament scriptures. And so, folks, what, what I'm saying is this. If you're serving God, if you're living for God, if you're trying to do anything for Jesus, you are going to get criticized. It's going to happen. Expect it. Understand it. And, you know, i got to tell you, one of the things about critical people is this. When, when folks criticize, it, it, you know, it always seems like it's more of them than what it really is. So, see, the devil, he, he, loves to, he loves to put a magnifying glass on those critics to make you think it's a lot more than what it really is. So I'm just telling you, man, if somebody criticizes you, this is what you, what you have to understand. That's their opinion. But as long as you're following God, you've got your opinion. And, and, and you know what? Your opinion is just as valid as their opinion. And, and what you need to understand is they are not your judge. They are not your judge. I mean, think about this. It doesn't make any sense, does it? 
But, but again, there, there are religious people that are in this world that are going to criticize you because you're excited about the fact that Jesus has changed your life. That, that mo most critics, like we read here, they're rebuking this guy because he's excited about what Jesus has done in his life. Now, you say, preacher, I can't understand that kind of stuff. Well, I can't either, but I, I, listen to this. I heard a story of a pastor of a church, and uh, he was pastoring this church, and this church was a dead, dead church, okay? But, but there was a couple of young guys in that church that got saved, and they got on fire for the Lord, and, and, and they just started getting excited in the church service, and, and they started saying amen in the church service. They said Amen got one that agrees with that amen and, and 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 you know what happened the leaders of that church came to that pastor pharisees and they came to that and they rebuked that pastor for those guys saying amen and getting excited in the church and you know what they said they said we don't want anybody saying amen in the church we don't want anybody clapping hands and getting all excited because we don't want to get off on some wildfire. Well, folks, let me tell you something. We're a long way from wildfire, all right? And, and I'm going to tell you something. I would, I would rather cool down a fire than resurrect the corpse any day. Hallelujah. And, and so, you know what they did? They told that pastor, you need to go tell those guys to quit getting so excited. You need to quit. You need to tell those guys. Do not say amen. And, and you know, thank God the pastor said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get between them and the Lord. Why, why am I to do such a thing? And you say, Pastor, I don't understand that kind of stuff. Well, I don't either, but I'm just telling you, and I'm just showing you right here from the Word of God that the first thing that this blind man who could see faced was a bunch of folks that wanted to talk him out of his experience and said that Jesus who healed him was a sinner, critical, a critical spirit. Listen to me, child of God. Don't have a critical spirit. To have a critical spirit means that you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. To be a critical spirit, listen, you cannot be used of God to have a critical spirit. You cannot be blessed by God to have a critical if you have a critical spirit. You, listen, you cannot have the hand of God on your life if you walk around all the time having a critical spirit. God condemns that. And so notice here that they want to cool things down, you know? <laughs> I thought about that story a minute ago. You say, Pastor, does it bother you when anybody in the church says amen? No, sir. I need these amens. I need some help up here. I'm not up here by myself, man. I need you. Help me. I preach better if you say amen. I focus better if you say amen. And at least when somebody's saying amen, at least I know at least six people are not asleep and they're awake. And at least I know six people are excited about the Lord. And by the way, amen is biblical. I read the book of Nehemiah and O Ezra the prophet stood up and preached the word of God on a pulpit, and all the people stood up as he preached the Word of God. And the Bible says as he preached the Word of God, the people said, Amen and Amen, which means so be it. I believe that. Hallelujah. Man, that, that's biblical. So don't listen. Don't let the, the critical people cool you down in this church. Don't, don't. And you say, who's doing that? I don't know, but it got quiet all of a sudden. I'm just... Preaching to God, I'm just preaching here, something, well, maybe there is, but, but I'm just telling you, don't let anybody rob you of your excitement for Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody pour cold water on your fire. Critical people. I mean, this poor guy, man, he just had a, I mean, good grief, he just had a miracle happen in his life. 
He's on fire for the Lord. And they want to criticize him. They want to cool him down. Criticism. You, you know, um, listen, in life, this is what you got to understand. When you do things for the Lord, um, there's going to be people that criticize you. And, and as a pastor for, for years now, um, I, I just got to tell you, sometimes, pastor in the church, you got to make decisions that are tough. And especially when you're following the book, there's decisions that you have to say that, no, we can't do this or we can't do that. And, and you, know what, you, know what the, you know what happens sometimes? It sparks criticism. But, but this is what I have learned in my Christian life, and let me just say this, I'm not just talking about pastor, and I'm just talking about anything you're doing for the Lord, um, whether you just made a commitment to serve Him, whatever, whatever it is, listen, th- this is what I've come to realize in my Christian life. I know that one day, as a believer, I'm going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And friend, I'm not going to have to stand before a bunch of critics and complainers at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to be standing before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. And so as long as I'm pleasing Jesus, then I don't need to worry about the critics. Hallelujah. And so, listen, same goes for you. Listen, listen whatever you do, you, you, you need to understand in your life, when you make decisions of truth and you receive criticism, you got to understand that you're not going to stand before those people at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to stand before Jesus. So you're going to get criticized. So like that old saying, let it roll off your back like water on a duck's back. Amen? Man, I, I, I love this. this. This young blind man really inspires me. Because, because notice, he, he, he wasn't cowered down by those Pharisees. I mean, come on. They kept on. And they kept on. I don't have time to read all the text, but they kept on and they kept on. They kept questioning him. They kept asking him all through this text. And I love what he says over there in verse 25 in so many words. I'm paraphrasing, but, but he said, listen, man, I already told you guys what happened. Man, evidently, you're not listening. Here are the facts. I once was blind, but now I can see. And those are the facts, brother. And then I love what he says in verse 27. He says, then you ought to be his disciples too. Now look at this. This is so cool. Inspires me, man. These guys, this guy had, he had spiritual discernment that knew that that most Pharisees aren't even saved. Most Pharisees, listen, they're not even born again. They're pounding him, and I love what he says in verse 27. He answered them, and he said, I told you already, and did you not hear? Wherefore, you will hear it again. And then I love this. He goes, will you also be his disciples? (laughs) You know what he's saying? He's saying, you ought to be one of his disciples too. (laughs) You ought to get saved. That's what he's saying. He just starts preaching to them a little bit, doesn't he? Amen? And so, you know what? Listen. They didn't calm him down. You know what? I love this. They didn't calm him down. They fired him up. Man, I got to tell you, whenever I'm in ministry and I, there's criticism happening, you know, because it comes all the time. It's just part of the, the territory. You know what it does? It doesn't calm me down. It fires me up. When somebody criticizes what, what God is doing, you know what? That's just confirmation that God's doing the work because if God wasn't doing the work, you wouldn't have any critics. So that just fires me up. You say, Pastor, what do you do when people criticize you? You know what I do? I just get the pedal, and I just press it a little further to the metal. Amen? I mean, it's confirmation. It fires me up. I love it. He didn't didn't cower down. So, skepticism. Can I get an amen? Criticism. Can I get an amen? And then there is a third, listen, a third voice that you may have to face and that is ostracism they kicked this guy out they excluded him now 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 get this man just got saved man just got a miracle from god here comes the doubting skeptics right questioning his experience and then here comes the disapproving critics 
criticizing him for what he's doing for the Lord. And now he's running into the domineering bullies. Bullies. Have you ever met a bully? They're in the Bible. These Pharisees again. Now, now notice what they did. Poor guy, they, they kicked the guy out of the group. They excluded him. Ostracism. Now, follow the teaching. Verse 30. The, the Bible says the man answered and he said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing. Man, what are you guys, what are you guys discrediting God? This is a great thing. That, that you know not from whence he is, and, and yet he has opened my eyes. I mean, come on. He, he, he opened my eyes. He says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Then he's preaching to him. He says, Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? And then, and then listen what he says. He says, If this man, talking about Jesus, if this man was not of God, he could do nothing. In other words, if he wasn't of God, he couldn't do this. And notice what happens. They get mad. They answered and they said unto him, Thou was altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? You know what they're saying? How dare you tell us what the Bible says? How dare you try to teach us? We're the elite. We're the Pharisees. How, how dare you? And then notice what they did to him there. The Bible says that they cast him out. They kicked him out of the synagogue. They excommunicated him. You say, man, Brother Danny, that's, that's horrible. No, let me tell you something. I'd rather be outside with Jesus than inside without him. I mean, they kicked him out. Outside. Did you know that um, Martin Luther was actually kicked out of the Roman Catholic Church because he said, the just shall live by faith. In other words, he said, you shall not, you're not saved by your works, but you're saved by your faith. And they kicked him out. Did you know that Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great evangelist of the 19th century, was actually kicked out of the Baptist Union of Great Britain? Because this is what he said. He said, our churches are, are going dead and they're going liberal. And this is what was happening at that time. Spurgeon said that the churches were denying the virgin birth of Jesus. And he said, if we don't have a standard in our Baptist churches, if we don't uphold to the integrity of Scripture, he said, then England is going to be plunged into godlessness and darkness. And you know what they did? They kicked him out of the church. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And did you know the night that they kicked Charles Haddon Spurgeon out of the Baptist Union when they voted to oust him? History books said that everybody stood up and there was a wild clapping celebration. They kicked him out. But guess what? His prophecy, if you want to call it a prophecy, his prophecy is true today. Because if you study anything about Great Britain and England today, as far as spirituality goes, it's a wasteland. England is. You study it. I mean, most of the churches are boarded up. There's no gospel preaching hardly there at all. You know why? Because they kicked the Bible and they kicked God out of the church. And God judged them. And today, when you look at England, it is a spiritual wasteland. This prophecy came true. And let me just say this, you can take this for whatever it's worth, but America better grab a hold of that. Because folks, we will become just like England if we kick God and the Bible and the truth and the inspiration of the Word of God out of our churches. We, we start kicking God out of our country. We start kicking God out of, uh, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance or saying in Jesus' name when we pray. If we continue to go this way, we will be just like England just like them, godless spiritual wasteland. And, and so they, they kick the guy out. But I love this. Get this. They kicked him out. But the Bible says that Jesus found him. Je Jesus came to this guy after he got kicked out. Now, this blessed me so much because 
Jesus brought him to the place where he said, Lord, I believe. I believe in you. You, you see, folks, here's, the, here's what can happen. When you face skepticism and when you face criticism and then you begin to be ostracized and isolated by people, you know what? There's a tendency where you think, you know what? God has forgotten me. God, God has left me. And I, and I love this. Jesus comes back to this man. And he encourages him and he gets the man to confess, Lord, I believe who you are. Get this, this is, so, this is so beautiful. The Bible says, notice in verse 35, it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when they had found him, he said unto him, Does thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and he said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talks with thee. And notice what he said. He, he brings him to that place. He says, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Folks, always remember, when you feel alone, Jesus is always there. And he'll always come find you and give you a word of encouragement to enlarge your faith. He'll come to you when you begin to be ostracized and beat up by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And you know what? He'll come to you like he's doing to you right now today. He's filling you with his word because he's wanting to bring you to the place where you'll get your eyes off those people and you'll get your eyes back on him. Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. That's what God wants to do with you today. Listen, don't let the voices of discouragement discourage you. Don't let them rob you of your salvation. Don't Listen, don't let them distract you from doing what God has called you to do. Because, folks, ultimately, this is what they want to do. Now, listen to what I'm getting ready to say. This is what they want to do. Are you all awake? Are you still alive? This is what they want to do to you. That They say that if you have a bucket of crabs in a bucket, and, they're all, and all those crabs are in that bucket, that if one crab tries to climb out of that bucket, they say it's the instinct of those other crabs to pull that crab back down. I mean, that's the instinct of a crab. And crabs, if you have them in a bucket, if one of them tries to pull out, the other ones are going to grab that crab and pull him down. Folks, there's always somebody that's going to try to pull you down and hold you down. And they don't have any joy. And they don't want you to have any joy either. I mean, think about it. That's what they did with Jesus. I mean, is, is that not what they did with him? This, this religious crowd? The, these ones that were skeptical? skeptical? How, how, about, how about that? I mean, what, what, is that not what they did with Jesus? They criticized him? They dogged him from... From day one, when he preached and when he ministered, they just tried to pull him down. Finally, they got a man by the name of Judas Iscariot to betray him, right? See, they were trying to pull him down. They were trying to hold him down. They were trying to suppress him because they did not agree with him, because he did not fit in their religious mold. They got the Roman government to arrest him. They got Roman centurions to rip his back to shreds with a scourge. They laughed out and they said, we're going to kill him. We're going to nail him down. We are going to nail him to an old rugged cross. And with great relief, as Jesus was hanging on that cross, dying in agony and shame, bleeding, they said, yes. We have shut him up. We have stopped him. They put in his tomb a stone in that place. And they said, we're going to hold him down. We're going to keep him down. We've won. But after three days and three nights, that stone was rolled away. And Jesus Christ came out of that tomb alive, and you know what Jesus said when he came out of that tomb? 
You know what he said? He said, nothing is going to hold me down. Nothing is going to hold me down. Hallelujah. Listen, don't let him hold you down either. Don't let him pull you down. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes.